Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Jack Nod, and I'm the dean of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy. And I want to welcome you to uh, this conversation with one of my very favorite people, uh, Rafael Bostic. Uh, Rafael, and I, Rafael and I will be discussing the state and direction of the US economy. We're also going to talk about opportunity and the issue of inequality as well as uh, one of uh, a strong point uh, for the Price School, which is uh, good governance. Uh, and we'll see how those things intersect. Uh, before I introduce Raphael, however, there are a couple uh, guests here that I would like to acknowledge. And uh, the first is Representative Yvonne Burke. Uh, she's the first African-American woman elected to Congress from the West Coast from 1973 to 78, and she's also the first member of a racial minority group to chair the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors retiring from the board in 2008. So please uh, welcome <laughs> Representative Burke. Uh, I also wanted to welcome Jan Perry. Uh, Jan is the head of the Los Angeles Economic and Workforce uh, Development Department. She's played really a critical role in the major, several major projects in revitalizing and developing the downtown of Los Angeles. But she's also been a tireless champion uh, for homelessness uh, and uh, for affordable housing. And uh, so we uh, commend her for that as well. And of course, most important, she's a Trojan, having received her MPA uh, degree from the Price School. So welcome, Jan. Thank you for coming as well. In some ways, uh, Raphael needs no introduction for this group in the room, since we're all friends and family here g gathered together. Uh, but since we are recording this, and some people may be uh, watching it from across the country or around the world <coughs> online, uh, let me say a few things uh, about uh, Raphael. Uh, I'm going to start by saying he's a professor uh, here in the Price School. Uh, but for this conversation, probably more importantly, uh, he, in 2017, became the 15th president and CEO, CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And in 2018, uh, a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, which is the committee that uh, makes decisions uh, about interest rates and the money supply nationally, a hugely important position. Uh, before heading to the Federal Reserve in Atlanta, he was a professor here uh, since 2001. And his research has focused on uh, real estate economics, uh, housing finance, um, home ownership, uh, and neighborhood development. And more recently, uh, he's uh, been also working on uh, the importance of institutions in shaping uh, policy effectiveness and policy development. I, reading through and preparing for this, I was surprised uh, to recall how many uh, leadership roles uh, Raphael has uh, accepted and has played at the school. Uh, he also, well, at one point, was head of the Master of Real Estate Development Program. He also was the founding uh, director of the Kasdan Forecast. Uh, uh, for, for the economy, uh, and he served uh, in 2008-2009 as the interim director of the Lust Center uh, for Real Estate. More recently, he uh, was the first chair of our uh, academic department of governance management and the policy process at the Price School from 2016 to 17, and he's the prior holder uh, from uh, 2012 to 2017 of the John and Judith Bedrosian Endowed Chair uh, in Governance and the Director of the Bedrosian Center. So uh, one other thing I should mention, uh, prior to, uh, Raphael also had a prior leadership role uh, in the federal government. This is not his first major leadership role with the government. He was the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So would you join me in please welcoming Raphael? So uh, we're going to have a little conversation. I'm going to ask some questions, and we're going to have a discussion about it. Uh, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, and uh, Aubrey's going to give me a signal when to do that, uh, for, because we want you to all have a chance to 
talk and interact with Raphael as well. Uh, but we thought uh, we would start with um, some sort of basics uh, about the Federal Reserve. You know, it's a very complex organization, but a hugely important one. So I thought I'd just start by asking uh, how you would describe uh, the mission uh, of, of the Fed in its various dimensions. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to see so many people. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to put this together. Um, so it's always a, a fun time to talk about the things that I'm working on and uh, the things I'm working on a little different than they were a year ago. So, uh, so uh, you know, part of my job really has been to go around the country, uh, go around my district, which is the, the sixth district. I'll say a little more about that in a bit and just talk to people. A lot, a lot of my, my uh, time is spent talking to business leaders, talking to community people. And one thing that I've learned is that no one has any idea what the Fed does. Right then, no one, no one knows what we do at all. So, uh, so when Jack said he wanted to, to start sort of with the basics, I was like, that's a good idea, because this is the level set it to make sure everyone is, is aware. So uh, we have multiple missions at, at the Fed. Um, one mission that most people are familiar with is monetary policy. Um, and that, that function is really about maintaining a stable price level and maximizing employment. Those are the two objectives of that, that mission. But we do a whole host of other things as well. So uh, we are a bank regulator. So we supervise and regulate uh, banking institutions uh, to ensure that banking operates in a safe and sound way and that capital and credit is available uh, to all the different uh, levers of the economy that, that might want it. Um, we actually are in, in instrumental in, set, in settlements for transactions. So uh, retail payments, wholesale payments, uh, all those sorts of things. So when you pay your credit, when you buy something at Walmart, uh, that's a, that is a pledge that money will come out of your account and go into Walmart's account. Um, the Fed has a backbone that facilitates all the settlements. And, that, uh, and we settle what, two, two times a day, basically billions of dollars that happen. Uh, my office in Atlanta is, is responsible for national oversight of all retail payments. So um, those are the many millions of transactions that happen, usually small volumes. But we're also responsible for uh, the, uh, the larger things. So, so when you wire folks, when you wire money for a down payment, those large things, that also goes through a Fed backbone. So, so we are very instrumental in the payment system. Uh, the Fed also is... Uh, quite important in, in the area of cash. So there's no cash that goes into distribution that doesn't at first go through a Federal Reserve bank or branch. Uh, so we have, uh, the money comes from the Office of Bureau of, en of Engraving, comes to one of the Fed uh, banks, uh, and then banks around the country put in orders to our institution saying, I need $3 billion or however many it is, uh, and then we give the transfer. Right? And then they will bring money to us. We're responsible for reviewing dollar quality and all that. We have a shredder downstairs. And, and so, um, so, so there's all that. I, I should have brought bags of money. Uh, think yeah, about yeah. it. I have bags of the shredded, shredded money. Um, uh, and then we also have um, a function. Is that what the bank uses as confetti, confetti when you've had something special? Just no, bags no, of no, no. <laughs> no, we keep it in a bag. No. <laughs> um, and then, uh, then we also do uh, community economic development. So uh, we have, uh, I have a staff that's responsible for being out on the ground uh, in communities across the district to try to help uh, those places figure out what they want to do and then how they can do it more effectively. And one, one thing we're trying to do is, is really integrate that function with a lot of the other things that we're doing to, because this has implications for broader economic development for broader economic performance. And uh, I'm trying to send a message that uh, we should view that economic development as an important component of our broader economic policy uh, because it has real implications for uh, the productive capacity for the entire country. And then the last thing that, that we do is we inform people. So I go around, I give speeches. Uh, we do a lot of research um, to try to explain how the economy is working and give people enough information so that they can make decisions either on the business side or on the community side, our personal side, about what the best strategies are for, for, for investing money and for, uh, 
for really uh, living with a high quality of life. So we do all those things, and um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You, you talk, I, I talk to people, and they're like, I didn't know the Fed did that. And, that, and so, so I want to make sure we don't have that conversation anymore, <laughs> here at least. Uh, so that, that's what we do. Yeah, well, thank you. That was a great overview. Uh, and I've had the same experience. People know it regulates the interest rate. But beyond that, they really don't know too much of what the Fed does. Um, the other aspect that I don't think people understand that much about the Fed is it has a rather complicated, unique structure. And uh, it's made up of economists, but also regional uh, industry people, et cetera. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit about why this structure and how does that serve the mission uh, so that people get a sense of that structure and also the, you know, the Atlanta Fed, uh, which is where you're located. So, um, so the Fed is a, it's kind of a hybrid system. So uh, the system was established in 1913 from the Federal Reserve Act. And the debate leading up to that was, should the US have a central bank? And if they have a central bank, who should control it? And so some wanted it to be centralized in the seat of government in Washington. Others said, no, 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 Let's, it should be distributed around the country. So what we'd have as a system is a little of both. We have a board of governors in Washington that's seven people. Um, that's the central board. And then we have 12 reserve banks that are uh, distributed around the country, and I'm the president of one of them. Uh, and what they did, they divvied the country up according to where there was economic power in 1913. Right, and so, so, if you, so if you look at the distribution of our districts, it's not even. So the sixth district, which is Atlanta's district, it accounts for one sixth of the US economy's performance. Uh, the 12th district is probably a third to almost 40%. So, uh, because the economic activity has shifted over time. And uh, we've not moved the boundaries and we're not going to move the boundaries that, that require us to open up the Federal Reserve Act and we're not gonna do that. Uh, uh, and so the way the, the structure is, the 12 reserve banks are technically not governmental. So I'm not a government employee. We, we are a quasi-public, quasi quasi-private organization. I report to uh, a board of directors uh, for my reserve bank. Um, uh, nine people on the board, three are bankers, six are other significant leading people from around the district. And my district is all of Florida, all of Georgia, all of Atlanta, the bottom half of Mississippi, the bottom half of Louisiana, and the eastern two-thirds of Tennessee. So, that's, so it's a large district. It, it's diverse, right? So <laughs> it, it keeps me busy. Uh, but, it, but, it, but the hybrid is, is, um, is really designed to make sure that there's a lot of information around the country that informs policymaking. Now, in terms of the could, power... Could you, could you just say something? When you say hybrid or semi-government, what does that actually mean? Is it, it's not a nonprofit, it's a government corporation, or what, it, what is the actual institutional? So I think the technical term for what we are is a government potentiality. <laughs> potentiality. <laughs> yeah, but nobody knows what that is. I actually really don't, I don't know what that, that really means either. Um, uh, so, so we are not, we are not part of the federal government. We are um, empowered and set up by a federal act, but are explicitly chartered to be outside of the federal government structure. Um, and, and part of the goal there was to um, have um, distributed locuses of power, right? So, so each district actually has its own independent influence in terms of what the voice looks like. So in the search process for, for, for my job, uh, there was a board, it was a search committee set up by people from our board, from the Atlanta board. And they conferred with Washington about what they were doing, but they got to do what they wanted to do. And so there is a, there is a significant amount of independence there. Uh, one other thing to say is, so in terms of the, the FOMC, the interest rate making body, um, the votes are distributed, right? So there are 12 votes at all times. The seven governors always have a vote. Um, the president of the New York Fed always has a vote. And then the other four votes are distributed among the other 11 presidents. So I'm in a cycle with two other banks. I think it's Dallas and I think St. Louis. Uh, but we rotate. 
So every year it rotates to the next person. So this is Atlanta's year, so I have a vote. Um, and, and that's how that functions. Chicago and Cleveland, they, they toggle back and forth. So there are only two there. And then the other two seats are three and three. So uh, I, I find that interesting for at least two reasons. And, uh, one is it's connecting a regional perspective with the national perspective uh, on the economy, right, in that FOMC. Uh, and the second is it's taking people who are uh, running businesses and even some nonprofits. I, I think I, I read that uh, the Habitat for Humanity CEO yeah, Jonathan is Jonathan Rickford, he's is one of my members. Yeah. So, people, so it's taking people like that and mixing it, them with people who are a big time economists pretty much, right, and at the national level. And d do you find that a, a valuable uh, mix of region and business people and economists, or does that make it more difficult for the Fed to, to function? It's a little of both. I mean, I, I think it's more valuable than less. So uh, what we've done in, our, in the 6th District is we've hired people whose job it is just to drive around and talk to business people. Right? We call them regional executives, and their job is to get a pulse of what's happening in the local district. Because uh, one thing that I believe is true is that business people on the ground, community people on the ground, see things before they show up in aggregate data. Mm -hmm. right? And to the extent that I can find out stuff early by talking to folks and then have that inform our, our policy making, it keeps us ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the way the FOMC works, everybody gets to make speeches. You sit around a big table, everyone gets to make a speech. So, uh, so when I do my remarks, I always try to make sure that I incorporate some of that local intelligence. Tell some stories that are illustrative of some of the, the trends and issues that I think are important, uh, because I want to make sure that that stuff gets in, gets known by all the policymakers that, that should know it. And so I, I think it's actually been quite, quite valuable. It takes a lot of time, right? I mean, you, you know, my district is large, so to, to have people to really have, a, have a, the, an understanding of all the different things that are going on. I got, I got farming, I got military, I got international, I, like, a lot of manufacturing as well. Uh, but it's, it's actually been quite rich and, um, and always interesting. Because, you know, I've, um, from reading about this, lear learned that in the savings and loan crisis you know, some years ago, that the uh, people who were involved on the ground, as you described, sort of anticipated this crisis before the economists uh, did. And they were starting to talk about the implications of that. And I was surprised a little bit that in the recent financial crisis in 2008, something like that didn't happen. It seemed like the Fed didn't get that local intelligence, right? That, um, Things were really in in trouble, in, and uh, yeah. is that some Alan accurate? Alan Greenspan. <laughs> That's one word. Alan Greenspan, I think, was so, for a lot of that. So, I know I want to distinguish these, right? So, so um, what? Uh, first of all, I was not there, right? So, <laughs> so I. I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, not going to. Right, I just want to be clear on this right at the beginning. Be uh, but 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 I would I would say this. Um, I think there were a couple things that happened in that instance. One, there was some frothiness that was happening in institutions that regulators did not appreciate as much. So the sixth district was the worst performing district in the country in terms of bank failures, in terms of foreclosures. And people in my bank lost their jobs because of the aftermath of that. So, so this is something that is very present in our minds, that the regulatory structure, the regulatory infrastructure has got to pay attention to concentrations of risk and be willing to act on that. So I think that's, uh, that's an important first step. A second step, which I think is also important, is there were a lot of people who saw the shifting of standards, who saw sort of a willingness to, to just get the transaction done without any concern or consideration about the amount of risk that was being transmitted into the system. And I think that is also an important component. Uh, actually, I'm going to go four now. A third component 
is that th there was an increased complexity of instruments in the financial system such that risks were distributed and then redistributed and then redistributed. And there was nobody who really had a deep appreciation for how they were compounding each other. So when things started to go bad, no one would have predicted that it would have, like the small disruptions wound up having systemic implications. Like when Bear Stearns uh, started Buckle, um, it rippled through to, to companies that did not think that they were that exposed. And it took years and years and years to unpack that. And then the fourth is sort of the pricing policy. Like low interest rates did provide incentives uh, to, to be leveraged. And that whole era was an era of excessive leverage, right? And, and uh, institutionally, we did not have anyone whose job, who got paid if leverage didn't happen, right? And so we, we also have to think, it's just, do we have systemic incentives that um, will put breakers on the marketplace? And to the Greenspan comment, uh, Greenspan was a true believer that, the mark, that it was not likely that the market would get to what economists would call corner solutions, those extreme outcomes. Uh, he was wrong, right? And, and one thing I... It was a while to admit it, but he did. Uh, well, yeah, people are wrong all the time, right? So I, I was wrong Very yesterday. Right. Like, I thought the Eagles were going to lose yesterday. I was, yeah. I was glad that they didn't. But, but, but I, I would say this. Um, he had a faith in the market that I've never had, right? So, I was a, I'm a psych, I was a psych, psych major before I was an econ major. And psychology, when you study psychology, you, you learn that people are not rational all the time, that people mess up all the time, that there is often herd mentality because people take shortcuts, and that people can be manipulated. Right? And what that, what that suggests then is that a, a ruthless adherence to the predictions of hard models um, is likely to get you to a place that's different than where the world is really going to go. So we've got to be mindful about this. The models are helpful and they're instructive, but there is more that we need to think about in terms of uh, crafting policy and making expectations. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, switch topics a little bit now. Uh, you made reference to the Fed's role in uh, the overall economy and uh, especially uh, the uh, Atlanta Fed. Uh, from my reading about this, the Atlanta Fed has actually been an innovator in, in that, uh, especially in their uh, uh, now and wage growth track, tracker. Uh, 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 it, these are uh, innovative uh, ways of understanding wage growth, uh, as well as looking at nominal prices. And so I wondered if you would say a little bit about uh, the direction and where you see the economy going and what role the... Fed plays in that. So I want to start by saying the, the staff in Atlanta has, has been great for me, right? They've kind of walked me along and not, not tried to put too much on me so I could figure out what's going on um, without, without looking bad while I'm doing it, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, and we have a, a number of tools that are, are really helpful. Um, so we have something called GDP Now, which is a, a, a real-time predictor of what uh, what GDP is likely to be for the current quarter. So we have an app. You can go online. You can get your GDP Now app. I have to do my commercial. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can go go wherever wherever you get your your podcasts or your apps. You can <laughs> you, can, you can pick up GDP Now. Um, we also have something called the Wage Tracker. So so you might know that in the last uh, few years, as the economy has been growing, wages have grown much less robustly. And so one question is, well, why is that? What's going on? And so we've tried to um, de disaggregate um, the, the wage dynamics according to how people are attached to the labor force. So some people transition from full-time to part-time. Some transition from part-time to full-time. Some are in full-time all the time. And so we're trying to see kind of are the dynamics different. And, and one thing that's been interesting is that the full-time to full-time wage dynamics have been pretty robust and strong. But the mix of the full-timers with the transition folks has changed in a way that in the aggregate it doesn't look as strong. So we're trying to understand all of these things. Um, at the bank more generally is really interested in, in labor markets. Um, so you know, we're trying to maximize employment. That's one of our missions. And um, so we've been thinking a lot about how do we do that? 
And as the economy evolves, um, what are the things that need to happen in order for our current workforce to continue to be employed and useful in, in the economy? So we're doing a lot on workforce development, a lot on skills retraining, a lot on trying to help people um, have hope in the economy that when change comes, they're not just gonna be left on the side of the road, but, we'll, but could actually have a plan that can keep them employed uh, in jobs that pay good wages. You know, I was interested in your point about full-time and part-time workers. Uh, one of the, th we, you know, we had Fred Ryan here uh, last spring, uh, who is the publisher of the Washington Post, and he s snuck something in near the end of his talk that I, was uh, startling to me, and that is they have about 10 times the readership as they had before. Most of that growth is online. But in the last two years, they've gotten rid of 300 people. And uh, th what they do instead is they hire people uh, part-time around the world when a story is there, right? And that kind of part-time employment is quite uh, common, it seems, with these kind of platforms uh, like the Washington Post has become. Uh, and w even with Uber and, and other, is that something that you're looking at in this regard as? Um, oh yeah, you know. No, no that, this is the future. And un understanding this and being able to articulate it has implications for our expectations about where the economy is gonna go and how it's gonna grow, mm -hmm. but also in terms of really being a resource for your, your citizens and your business leaders. So you know, the, the last thing I said the Fed does, we, do, we, talk, we talk to people, we try to inform them. And one thing that I think we need to be informing them about is how the economy actually really works. And, and um, so, that, so that when they see disruption, they understand that you know, disruption has always happened in this country. Right? So, so um, you used, there was a time when everybody, most people were farmers. Right? We don't do that anymore in terms of how we produce. So that kind of disruption, that, that's part and parcel of, of the evolution of every economy. Uh, but what we have to also think about is that um, when that change comes, people have got to then do other things. And uh, I think one of the things that makes this era particularly challenging is that that disruption is happening more rapidly than it has historically in this country and is touching a broader set of sectors. So that the number of people who actually are gonna have to find other things to do is just much larger than it's been maybe in the history of the country, which, which then begs the question, given the scale of the problem, do we need to really have institutions in place whose job it is to think about that and to manage that? Otherwise, you could wind up with far larger groups of people who kind of check out of the system, which is not helpful for anybody. Hmm. So uh, one of the other dimensions uh, that I wanted to ask you about in terms of the economy is um, we have had low interest rates for a long time now. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity uh, in the world economy. Uh, the uh, tax reform bill now just added over a trillion dollars to the projected uh, federal deficit. Uh, does that, from uh, the Fed's perspective, putting us in some uh, kind of uh, overheated situation, uh, is that a, do you see that as a major issue now? So we're watching that, right? So, so, um, Let's say this in a couple of ways. So, so one, when people ask about debt, right, and deficits, you know, what I, t I tell people, like, debt sometimes is a good thing, right? It allows us to do things. And, and part of the question is, what do you do with the money that you get from debt? And do you use it in ways that are productive so that you have a higher trajectory, you get more out, more out of the money? Um, and so for us with the, with the taxes, for example, um, right now I got staff who are just, they're tracking earnings calls to learn what businesses are going to do with the extra money. Right? If they invest in capital and they invest in new productive technologies and all that, then it could be a net positive. If they pay down debt and they um, buy back stock, Right? That has different implications for what we should expect to happen. And right now, I don't know how 
the money is going to be distributed across the, those various options. Uh, but that's what we're paying attention to to try to understand what the likely impact of this is, is going to be. So that, that I, don't, I don't really know what, what's going to happen. Um, we actually have contributed a lot of liquidity to the system as the Federal Reserve System uh, through the quantitative easing policy, where we bought a lot of bonds, treasury bonds, and uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, our balance sheet was originally $900 billion. Now it's $4.3 trillion. So, uh, so that's a lot, right? And but I understand the Fed is winding that down. So we've started a, pro a, pro a program whereby on a month-to-month -month basis we are... Um, uh, we are not reinvesting the full amount. I think that's the technical way you say it. Uh, <laughs> but we are basically shrinking the balance sheet, right? And we're going to shrink it down. We're not going to shrink it down to 900 billion. It's going to be more than that because some other circumstances have changed. But uh, we're trying not to be um, a force of stimulus uh, in the economy through that liquidity as well. That actually might be a counter. Uh, yeah, so our, our hope is that we're, we can return to a, a more normal stance uh, in a way that doesn't lead to a lot of economic disruption. Right? We don't want the volatility, so we want to try to do it in a slow, steady, everybody knows it just by rule, and it just becomes routine. And if it gets into the routine space, then people won't respond to it. That's our hope. Okay. I, I wanted to just ask you one other question about the economy. And this is also a national issue, but especially, I think, in the 6th District uh, in the South, and that is the difference between the urban areas, which uh, are doing quite well, and these large rural areas, which are not doing as well. And wondered if you'd say something about that as where the economy moves forward. Sure. So um, I'll start with just a, base, a simple story. So the state of Georgia. It has 159 counties. But, okay, think what? about that, right? So 159 counties. Uh, in, 20, right, in 2017, almost all the job growth for the state happened in 11. So that's 148 counties that are at zero or falling behind. Right? And many of those are rural. Right? So many of those are rural. So I'm, I've been trying to think, like, how can we as the Fed be a resource and speak to those places? And there are a lot of those places out there. And I actually believe that the people that live in those places know that they're falling behind. Um, and, um, but they don't know what to do. They don't, they don't know what a set of possible strategies might be. With, if you have 159 counties, you know, they're all very small. They don't have a lot of excess capacity to hire economic development experts and have consultants come down. They can't do those things, right? And so we're trying to figure out, are there things that we can do as an institution to facilitate some different kinds of conversations and get them on a, on a more hopeful path where they might be able to get some, some training, some plans, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're not there yet, so we're, we're just starting this. Uh, and you know, I'm hopeful that in the next year or so, um, we'll, we'll have learned some ways to talk to the rural parts of our district in ways that um, allow them to be forward-looking with some hope. But right now, it's, it's, a, it's a serious challenge. And um, you know, we think about things like the opioid uh, epidemic. I think they're, they are reflective of the fact that there are a lot of people in places that are falling behind who are basically checking out, and they're checking out to very, to very bad effect. Uh, I wasn't going to ask this, but I thought I'd add one more uh, issue around the economy, just because it's become a pretty big national issue and well, it, as well, and that is uh, immigration. And, uh, you know, the debate over whether the, the immigration that we've had is contributing to local economic development and to the future development of the country. Certainly that's the view in California, uh, but obviously also very controversial around the country. And does the Fed and the Atlanta Fed get engaged in that in some way? So, no, <laughs> we, don't, we don't get engaged in that, but, but it's important. I, I, I'm it, just thinking in terms of the modeling you do or the you know, so, yeah, we don't have, um, like in my staff, we don't have sort of an immigration expert per se. Uh, we do study labor markets, and we know that immigrants are important contributors to that. 
Uh, but I will tell you, when I talk to business leaders all over our district, they're all pretty clear that immigrants have been an important uh, co component of a successful business strategy. And you see it in uh, construction, you see it in a lot of the, the trades. So um, we're starting to see shortages. Uh, so, so this district, you know, we had Hurricane Irma, Maria, like all these hur hurricanes. And so there's a lot of building to do and um, they're running out of people. They don't have the workforce that's, that's there. And it's creating some, some real tensions and stresses. Um, Throughout our system, if, uh, I, I think just about every one of our presidents has commented on this, and um, we're all of the same mind that immigration has long been an important component of the American success story. And you know, if you go across this campus, right, we have a lot of immigrants who are being trained to be the best and the brightest, and they can either be working for us or they can be working against us. To me, I'd rather have them working for us. Um, and so we need to, to make sure that um, that this is a conversation that gets had. Now, where I have to like, draw the line, I don't get to decide on this, right? This is policy that other people are gonna do, uh, but what we can do is try to make sure that they have all the information those, that, they, that they should have so that we know that, that, that um, whatever decision they make, it was with a full set of information. Very good. All right, so that, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to shift, although we're getting into this next topic, and the next topic I'd like to cover is uh, the relationship of the Fed to the political system. And, um, you know, President Trump uh, has just recently replaced Janet Yellen uh, with a new Fed chair, even though it appeared as though she has been doing uh, a really good job, and that's very unusual to replace a Fed chair in that context. Uh, the new Fed chair, uh, Jerome Powell, is a lawyer rather than an economist. So I'm interested in that uh, transition and uh, does it make any difference that we now have a lawyer rather than an economist and what might that mean? So first, Janet was great. But <laughs> she was, she was, she's a great Fed chair and if you look at her record, um, there will be few Fed chairs that will be able to rival it. Uh, she, in, in, a, in a very short amount of time, uh, she created stability, she created confidence in the institution, she communicated, she developed a communication plan that everyone in the system agreed to, she built consensus, and the economic record, I think, is, is quite strong. So, she's great. Isn't is she also the first female? Fed first, Fed first female, yes. Point that out as well. Yes, yeah, so, but historic and all that. So, we did a farewell last week, and, um, you know, it was, people really liked her. Very sad to see her go. Um, but she's still got some other things to do. So, uh, uh, no, she's going to, for now, well, her husband is a professor at GW. So, um, so they're going to stay in Washington. She's going to go to Brookings. I think they announced that. She started, I think she started t today, actually. Um, and so she's joining Ben Bernanke. Uh, so, they're going to have a little Fed center there and talk about Fed policy, um, which, which would be neat. Um, in terms of Jay, uh, so Jay's been there for a long time. He's been there six years. He's not new to um, the policy space, and he's not new to these policies. Right? So he's, he was at the table when, when the, this whole approach to the gradual increasing of interest rates, the wind down of the balance sheet, all that kind of stuff, he was there for, and he voted in support of it. Uh, so I'm not expecting radical changes uh, in, in, from that perspective. And he, he's, he's smart, he's responsible, he doesn't like a lot of drama. Like all these things are very Fed type things. So he, he's well suited in that regard. Uh, go, moving into the future, it's been very interesting. Uh, so if you, if you look at stories about Powell, everyone says it'll be continuity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then there's always some paragraph that says, but we really don't know how he'll respond in the crisis, right? Because he's not an economist. He's like, it, you never saw a sense like that in any writing about Bernanke, any writing about Yellen, any writing even about Greenspan. So, so, the, so there's, a, there's a, an undertone in the marketplace of uncertainty, and, uh, but it's implicit at this stage. 
And then we'll just have to see how the markets respond. I mean, change is always change. And um, you won't know until you know. And so we'll see. Um, I will say the way that the Fed functions, you know, at the board, they got 200 research economists. So whoever the, is at the chair, they're not doing this completely by themselves. And, um, and so there's an infrastructure that can help guide and inform decision making. And he, he's going to take full, make full avail of that, right? So, so I, would, I would expect that, um, that you know, the Fed's a, a long, we're a long run institution. We, we, we think in terms of uh, continuity and, and clarity and all that kind of, I don't think any of that's going to change. And, and um, if there's one thing that may change, um, it would be, we will be more communicative, not less. I think, um, you know, I think transparency, uh, both with the public, but also with the Congress and with the White House, uh, is something that um, we are being much more mindful of. So when I go to Washington, uh, the FOMC meetings are on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Every Wednesday afternoon, I go to the Hill, and I'm trying to meet with every elected official in my district. Right, so they know who we are, they know what we do, they know the value we can provide, and they understand that we can be a resource for them. And I don't want there to be any, any misunderstandings about what the Fed is or what the Fed does, uh, because energy that we spend trying to um, uh, respond to policies that are not going to help us do our mission better, uh, that's energy that we're not spending doing the mission. Right? So I want to try as much as possible to prevent that. Now, I I understood that there is at least one difference between Yellen uh, and Powell, and that is uh, Powell seems much more amenable to uh, rolling back the uh, regulations that were imposed on banks uh, during, the Obama, right. ber during the Obama presidency. And uh, do you expect that to uh, play itself out in that way under Powell? And uh, what, sure. do you, what do, you, do you think that's a good thing or a, a bad thing? So yes, but just to be clear, there was deregulation that started before Powell took, took over. So, so, um, if, so the way the, the board is set up, uh, Dodd-Frank set up a provision where one of the governors is called the vice, the vice governor for supervision and regulation. And they're the point person for all the bank regulatory stuff and implementing Dodd-Frank. Before Randall Quarles, who's now that person, it was Dan Tarullo. Tarullo's exit speech detailed a bunch of things that he thought needed to be rolled back. And, so, and, and many of those were already started. So, so much of the deregulation that's happening was stuff that was already going, I, actually none of it's happened yet, so I want to not get ahead, but much that's being contemplated has been being contemplated for a long time, right? And so some of it will come out. I think for me, the two big areas that, that, that we need to think about most Capital requirements. Are we going to make in, retain high levels of capital the bank needs to have so that um, the insurance funds and the, the, the taxpayer dollars are more distant from risk? And then the stress tests for systemically uh, important institutions. And um, those stress tests have also been quite helpful in um, making sure that institutions are mindful about their exposure and their ability to be resilient in the face of a, of a steep, unexpected downturn, which is basically what we had in 2006 and 2007. So one last question on this topic. How, how important do you feel the Fed chair is relative to the FOMC? Is, is this a really critical position or one of a oh, team no, player? It's a big time position, right? So, <laughs> so, um, so, so, it, it, look, the board can be, the FOMC can be as collegial or as non-collegial as the chair wants it to be. But there ultimately is a risk, right? So I just told you the FOMC has 12 votes. Five of them are bank presidents. Those bank presidents are not actually accountable to Washington. They're accountable to their boards, right? And so, so if a chair is too difficult, too domineering, too disagreeable, and is holding a position that people think is wrong, right? There is no institutional discipline that that chair can put, and the chair can be at risk. And so you think about today. There are 
I think, three or four vacancies on the board of governors. Right? There are five bank presidents. So right now, there are more presidents voting than there are governors. Right? This is not a dynamic that happens very often, but it's, an, but it's an interesting dynamic because it has implications for how institutionally you lead in that context. And so you know, this, would be, this would be classic price school kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of analysis yeah, about, yeah. about board structure, coalition building, like all that yeah, kind of stuff yeah. is really going to come into play. And you know, the presidents are going to have to be part of that, that, that mix in terms of thinking about strategy. So uh, again, I w wasn't sure I was going to ask this, but I am. And that is, uh, you know, <laughs> President Trump by some accounts, has really challenged uh, many institutional norms, uh, including, for example, the relationship between the presidency and the Justice Department and the FBI, uh, and to some extent the courts, uh, also the news media. Uh, are you worried at all about the president's uh, and the White House's relationship uh, with the Fed in that context? Sure. I mean, we worry about these relationships all the time. And um, you know, I talked about the transparency earlier and our, our, my efforts to get out in front of people and talk to them. Uh, it's precisely because these relationships matter. Uh, what I would say, are the appointments that have been made to the Fed have not been as disruptive as some appointments to other agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that like, we still got a lot of vacancies and things can happen. Uh, for, for me, what I want to make sure is that I understand my job. I come with my information and do everything I can to make sure that we get to the right place. Right? And the, the year I have a vote, that means come informed, try to convince people that my view is the right view, and then vote according to that. And years I don't have a vote is to learn all I can learn, talk to all the people I can do, convince them that I know what I'm talking about so that they vote the right way. Or the, the, what I think is the right way. Um, and that's my job, right? And um, you know, I, I learned from my aunt uh, a long time ago, worry about the things you can control. And if I can't control it, I, I can't spend any energy on it because you know, there's nothing I can do. So I, I really try to, to like, keep my head down. Like, I'll, I'll talk to people. I'll try to convince them. Um, but that's the boundaries of where I am. So institutionally, though, I do think the likelihood that the Fed is going to become some radicalized agency that turns its back on a bunch of things that we've done historically, I think that's relatively low because of some of the independence that we've, mm -hmm. that we've gained and the responsibility that we've shown with the resources that we have. Um, you don't get a lot of exposés about, you know, Fed just had a, had a cruise to nowhere. And, you know, like, we don't, we don't do those things. And, uh, uh, we don't do those things, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and we're, but we're very mindful about it. So I had to tell you, like every trip I do, uh, we have conversations. Should you go to this group? Should you pay your own way? Should you leave before dinner? Like all these sorts of things, because you know, it just takes a couple of them. And then all of a sudden, the type of conversation people have about your organization changes. And so we never want to, we would never want to risk that. We always want to make sure that the things that we're doing don't raise those kind of questions. And so it's, I, I'm, I'm very close friends with my general counsel, <laughs> right? So we talk every day, so. Um, so I, uh, there's two other things I wanted to ask about in the few remaining minutes. Uh, one is uh, you're the first African-American president of a regional Federal Reserve Bank in the history of the country. And I'm wondering if you'd say something about that, how you've been uh, received and the implications of that. So um, it's been great. I, I, have, I have to say, uh, I was, when I first went to Atlanta to uh, meet with the staff for the first time, uh, the level of excitement in the building was, it shocked me. But people were very excited. They were very happy because um, it was just, it was a barrier that a lot of folks didn't think they'd ever see. Uh, and uh, so the reception has been, uh, been really quite good. Uh, the other thing I would say is um, these, it's difficult to be the first, right? Uh, because there are expectations 
that you're going to be something different. Mm -hmm. But you can't be so different that you lose sight of the core of what you're supposed to do. Right? And so what I've, tr I've really tried to just really be good and solid at the things that are the core to the Fed and let that be the statement. So I don't go out of my way to say, oh, I'm the first person to see all this sort of stuff. But rather, every time I go and talk to people, you know, I want to be on, on target, on the game, ask good questions, be engaged, and, um, and really let people know that, that you know, I'm thoughtful, I'm responsible, and when you have that experience with me, that means you should expect to have that experience with anybody else, regardless of what they look like. And, and that's been, um, so far, very, very good. The other thing I would say is um, I am talking about different things, and I'm talking about familiar things in different ways. And it's actually causing people to, to like, reconsider a lot of just baseline relationships. Uh, in ways that I think are hopeful. And you know, I haven't been there that long, so there are a lot of folks who I haven't met, but I'm really hopeful that um, just by being coming from a very different place, um, that will um, add uh, some richness to conversations. And the last thing I'll say on this is, in our building and in the Fed system broadly, we are starting, well, we, are under, we are doing a diversity and inclusion initiative. That is something that's actually quite important. Coming out of Dodd-Frank, we had to set up some office and that kind of stuff. And when I talk about diversity inclusion, uh, I always talk about it from the perspective that I believe that by being diverse and being inclusive, it makes our product better. Right? This, is, this is not about, um, I mean, there's a moral element to it, but it's actually, there's a productive interest that we have by, by having everyone contribute. And I've, I've worked a lot of teams with a lot of diversity. And the diversity it causes every idea, every thought to get challenged. Because people are coming from different places. They hear something they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And then you have to unpack it and explain it and, and really get to a different place. Um, and so by the end, all the things that didn't make sense to people are gone. Right? And what you have is a product that's pure, it's rigorous, it's very high quality, it's clear, and it like, triggers a different kind of understanding. So for me, I really think that that by turning our back on diversity, you're not embracing it fully, you're actually holding an institution back from being as productive and as effective as it could be. Excellent. Um, so this is the final question. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a game show or something. Uh, <laughs> um, I understand that you're involved in really an exciting new project uh, on access to opportunity. Uh, and that also deals with the very important issue we face in the country of uh, severe inequality. And so I'm wondering if you would say a little bit about this project, which I, I think is a really interesting initiative. Yeah, so this project actually started about two years ago, and um, I was very excited about it then, and I'm, sti I'm still quite excited. So when I was at HUD, we did a lot of work on um, economic development. And how should we think about economic development? And is there a way that you can do economic development that's inclusive? So that the people who have been in neighborhoods that have been outside of the economic uh, network, uh, when things start to happen and those places start to grow, can they grow in ways that the residents can, can benefit as well? And so we, we decided at HUD, I would go around and no one knew any examples where this would happen. I was like, well, we can't ask people to do things if we can't point to a success. Right? Otherwise, we're asking them to put their neck out for a dream or a hope, and no one's going to actually do that. Right? And so, um, so we decided to go and find them. So we were working in San Diego, in Portland, and in Seattle. We got people on the ground that are doing evaluations and assessments of efforts to try to do e inclusive economic development. And we're trying to figure out, well, did it work? Uh, and then if it did work, like, what were the elements that allowed it to be successful? And then try to translate those elements into something of a playbook that then we can give to other people. And um, we're, I think we have a report due in May, so, um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll find out, right? So yeah, I'll have to come back and tell you about that. But, but, but one other thing I would say is, um, I've also started talking in, in my district about the issue of economic mobility. 
So um, a report came out, um, I guess, the, toward the end of last year, where um, they ranked the 50 largest metros in terms of um, the, the probability that if you were born into poverty, you would not be in poverty by the time you were an adult. And um, of the 50, Atlanta ranked 49. Only Charlotte was worse. Yeah, only Charlotte was worse. And um, there were. Do you remember where LA stood in that? Uh, I don't. Well, I'll. I'll so we, we'll see, see, forget, see, but this is, this is where, if this was a podcast, I would just say it'll be on the show notes, right? And, <laughs> and so, uh, so I will have to do, do better next time. But, but what I would say is um, economic mobility is another one of these issues, um, like, like inequality, where uh, we're leaving resources on the table. Right? If, if people are, are born in the neighborhoods, and we, we, uh, the United Way in Atlanta did a map, and they can show sort of the communities where um, the resources are at a high enough quality that you, that you feel like the child has a fair shot versus where they don't. And in our region there, every county but one, and it's like a 12-county uh, region, every county but one had at least one neighborhood that was troubled. And so what I was trying to say, I gave a speech on this in, at the Rotary in January. What I was trying to say is this economic mobility issue is an everyone issue, right? It's, it's, it's very easy for people to say, oh, it's those neighborhoods over there. I don't have to worry about it. But there are more of those neighborhoods closer to you than, you act, than most people understand. And the, the more we talk about and understand that this is a collective issue, um, the, I think the more likely it is that people will actually get up and do something about it. Um, so so that it all, it's all part and parcel about trying to make sure that the things that we know and the thing that we've learned um, get brought to, the, to ground so that it, it winds up being applied in the real world to change how things happen and get people to really have a hope to have a better quality of life. That's a great aspiration. Uh, and I understand that even uh, social mobility in the United States now is a little less than it is in Europe, which is a reversal of historical trends. So I'm, I'm really pleased that you're engaged in this project. Um, can we get uh, interns uh, from the Price School <laughs> at the Atlanta Fed? Just uh, wondering. So yes. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, so, um, so I, I've been actually trying as much as possible to go to college campuses and to talk to people about the Fed and to give them uh, uh, an opportunity to think about us as a place that they might want to work. Uh, and I forgot to bring the business cards. So I, I, have, I had them make up special business cards with the intern c contact information on it that I'm supposed to walk with at all times. <laughs> but, but yes, and I, I, I will make sure that that information gets, okay. gets here. Um, and, and you should not just think about Atlanta. So there's a branch right down in Los Angeles. You got San Francisco. I mean, we got 12 of them, um, plus the satellite offices. So you should definitely think about what we're doing. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening. Uh, once again, uh, we really want to thank Raphael for coming and all the great work he's doing. With the